Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Until you say good morning, we're not starting. There it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. How are you guys doing? You guys doing well? Excellent. Trevien. Um, so we're starting something new today. Yes, amazing. It, truly amazing what we're going to study uh, until uh, most likely the end of the school year, un until we break for the summer. Uh, we're going to study uh, the attributes of God. So uh, before we pray, let me give you an idea of what's going to happen um, we have been studying the doctrine of sin, and we did that for 22 weeks. And when I say 22 weeks, you smile, and I don't know why. I smiled too. <laughs> it was great. Thank you, Michelle. It was great. That's why. And uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to study the, the attributes of God. And um, my idea is, obviously, we're not going to be able to get through every single attribute of God. It'd be impossible uh, to do that um, and to do it justice to it. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're, we're going to choose some attributes of God, and we're going to try to go uh, till June uh, with them. Uh, and we're going to try to do one attribute a week. There's going to be a couple of weeks that we're going to do two attributes. And the way that we want to do this is not just... Um, the theology for theology's sake. We want to. We want our theology to lead to doxology, uh, to worship. So there will be days that we are gonna sing, like we did last week, uh, at the end of our class. Uh, but then even days that we're every day. My idea is to every time we teach, for, to give you some some practical ways that you can put uh, these uh, attributes into practice uh, in day to day life. So let me pray for us and. We'll, we'll start. Father, you are so incredibly kind to us, and, and we are so thankful that you revealed yourself to us, that even though you are the God of the universe, the Lord of Lords, the Creator, uh, you are so far above us, you still have chosen to, um, to reveal yourself to lowly creatures um, through your creation and also through your word. And, and that's what we want to do this morning. We're going to study who you are. And even as we start this series, we want to worship you because you are uh, our God. And we want to know you better so that we will be able to know how to worship you better and how to live in a way that honors you because we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think, I, I don't know if I share, maybe with some of you I share a part of my testimony, but I grew up in a Christian home and I grew up going to uh, to church uh, constantly. We never miss church several times a week, uh, going to not only um, not only Sunday school, but then when youth group came ar around and my parents were super involved in church. And um, by the time I was in, in high school, we were going to a very good church. I was hearing the word. I'd made several professions of faith. You know how kids are. They don't want to go to hell and they feel bad. So they're like, oh, I'm a Christian. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to go to to hell where I'm going to be alone without my parents. I want to be with my parents. So when you, that kind of wears off when the kids are in high school because they don't think their parents are as cool anymore. <laughs> uh, so they're kind of like, well, so I, I remember having started to have doubts. I'd, I had been baptized. I didn't think, there were days that I thought I was a believer. There were days that I didn't think I was a believer. And when I got to college, I um, I was kind of like thinking, I was going to church, I thought that I was saved, and even though the church I was going to was a good church, I I thought that I was saved because I was a good, conservative uh, young man uh, at 18. Um, and then later on, when, uh, when I started college, I started going to a Bible study there, and... I remember that when the first summer after our first, our first meeting um, came around, they said, hey, we are going to, to do a class on how to share the gospel. Don't you want to do that? And I was like, yes, you know, I want to share the gospel with people. 
Um, and little did I know that I actually was going to be sharing the gospel with myself uh, during that time. I didn't know I wasn't saved. I just thought I was saved. And, and I remember the first Sunday, the first, uh, it was on Tuesdays, the first Tuesday this class started, the guy teaching the class started talking about God. And I was like, that's funny. I thought we were going to learn about, you know, um, I don't know, evangelism. And then the second week, he talked about God. And I thought, that's weird. And then the third week, he talked about God. And then he, he was going through this systematic study on God, and which later on, I found out it was the attributes of God. And we were reading this book that I'd never read before. It was called The Attributes of God by A.W. Pink. And I remember reading that book and just being amazed by God. And it got to a week, I think it was like week five or week six. He still was talking about God. Um, and he talked about the justice of God. And I remember driving home. I was living in San Fernando Valley, the 118 freeway, if you know the 118 freeway. I was driving to the 118 freeway. And I was thinking, if God is just, if God is God and God is just, then he has to judge me. Because I'm, I, don't, I don't live like God you know, wants me to live. I don't think, I mean, outwardly I was like a, a great kid. But inwardly, I knew myself. And it was incredible because it was the attributes of God that kind of led me to repent, to see God for who he was. And, and, and I think that it, there's no better way to start uh, a series on the attributes of God, a series that we're calling No One Like Him, uh, because we really need to know who God is. Um, it doesn't matter what you think of God. What matters is what God thinks of himself. And we all have these preconceived ideas, right? It doesn't matter. I mean, maybe you grew up in a, in a home that uh, didn't go to church or maybe went to the wrong kind of church or maybe you went to a good church. We still have preconceived ideas of who God is. Uh, and we need to learn who God is. So we're going to study God, God in these weeks. And, and especially this week, what we're going to look at we're going to look at just an introduction to the doctrine of God. Um, maybe it won't be as long as the other classes, but I want to introduce you because next week we're going to talk about uh, maybe not an attribute of God, but we're going to talk about the fact that we can know God. And we're going to talk about this idea of even though we can know God, God is incomprehensible uh, to us at the, at the same time. So in this series, we're going to find a lot, a lot of tensions right? There's going to be things that are going to be said that you're going to be like, wait, that's impossible. Like, how c I don't understand that. It's fine. I don't either. So we'll, we'll, we'll be together on that. Uh, we can't understand who God is, right? It's not, it's impossible for you to sit here and tell me, I understand the Trinity perfectly. Uh, if you do that, then I know you're a liar and we need to work on, we need to go back to the doctrine of sin, right? No one can understand the, doc the, the doctrine of the Trinity, but even as we're trying to understand who God is, my prayer has been, um, my son drove us here today. He's 15 and a half. So I was praying for safety mainly, but also for the class. You can ask me I was very quiet in the car. Uh, but um, my prayer is that really we would leave every single week with uh, just a, a, a large uh, God. That it wouldn't be this God that we put in our pocket and, He's our Jimmy, and he basically does whatever we want him to do. But he's this amazing God that we worship. And that this class would lead directly into the worship service as we uh, worship the Lord uh, through song and through hearing his word. So why study God? I, I can't uh, do better than the first quote you have in front of you that James here is going to read for us. Um, I think this is an amazing quote. Go ahead, James. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to this to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God? We might predict with certainty the spiritual feature of that man. Were we able to know exactly what our most influential religious leaders think of God today, we might be able, with some precision, to foretell where the church will stand tomorrow. Without doubt, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God, and the weightiest word in any language is its word for God. Okay, I'm going to tell you a, a quick story. I, uh, and I'm going to kind of develop this story as we learn about God. 
Um, during the time that I started studying the attributes of God many, many years ago, uh, a friend of mine suggested that I would go to local temples of different religions to see how they saw their God. So I remember going to this Buddhist temple, probably one of the largest ones uh, in, in the West, and um, talking to people there. And I remember talking to this young woman, uh, at the time she was in mid-20s, and I was asking, I, I asked her about, you know, who was God? And she was like, I don't know. I mean, she was there worshiping. She's like, I don't know. I just come here because I was told to. And it was really interesting because I wonder if, if, if I was to say to you, I won't, who is God? You wouldn't say I'm here because my wife told me to or my husband told me to. Or if I was to talk to your kids or grandkids, they wouldn't say my parents brought me. Maybe they do, right? But I, I wonder if you can understand who God is. Who is God? And what Tozer is saying here is that what comes into your mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. You know, when you think of God, who, who is God to you? And, and it's funny because our society talks about God, right? You hear people say, oh, thank God that this didn't happen. Do they really mean that? Or, or when they're upset, they mention the name of God. Uh, or when... Or when they're surprised by something, they mention the name of God, right? Some kind of deity. Why would they do that? What is it that drives them to, to claim God or to talk about God? Or when they are angry about something, to mention the name of God? Why would they do that? And I think it's because our view of God is completely, completely the opposite of what it needs to be. Even as we talk to one another, as we're going to see later on, Sometimes we mention the name of God in such a cavalier fashion, not understanding who God is and what he does, right? So I want to kind of go through um, in, the next, uh, in the next few minutes as, as to give you a couple of examples of people that knew God, people that don't know God, or those people that know parts about God uh, and, how, and what that leads them to do. Why don't you go with me? to Exodus chapter 5, Exodus 5. And this is what we're calling in your, in your outlines there. It says, not knowing God, an unbeliever's perspective. So Exodus 5. Story that is very well known to all of us. Well... I'm going to ask Ryan, not the whole chapter, right? <laughs> Just verses 1 and 2, please. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Okay, so thank you. So here you have, what is the context for this, this story? You remember, what, ha what has happened so far? Exodus 1. Yeah. Yeah, so God's people are, and they're enslaved, they're in Egypt. What happened after that? Yeah, but even before that, right? God chooses this, this young man. Who, yeah, this young man who's 80 years old, right? Who's working for his father-in-law at 80. Not bad, right? And then he's there, and then God chooses this man, and he tells him, hey, you need to go to Pharaoh, and you need to tell them what? Let yeah, let my people go. You, you need to let... And obviously Moses, we're not going to get into this, but Moses is kind of like, well, no, maybe I don't speak very well. Um... And then he finally goes, right? Chapter 5. So Moses goes and says, hey, Yahweh, our, my God. Actually, he doesn't say my God. He said, Yahweh says, right, that uh, let my people go. And he quotes God to him. And look what Pharaoh does. Pharaoh is not like, oh, yeah, right away, immediately. Pharaoh does what any other person would do. And they're like, Who, What? Who is this Yahweh? I'm sure he's thinking about the pantheon of gods that they have, right? 
they're thinking about the God of death, the God of whatever, you know, harvest, fertility, all these things. And he's thinking, none of those gods. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we're uh, Yahweh. I, I don't know this guy. And, and look what he says. He says, who is this guy that I should obey him? Uh, and then I do not know Yahweh, and besides, I will not let Israel go. I think we can argue uh, pretty strongly that Pharaoh's unbelief is what causes all the problems that Egypt is going to have, right? His unbelief, he doesn't care who God is. He, he doesn't know God, and not knowing God is the most important thing about Pharaoh. And sometimes we make it as, well, he had a hard heart. Yes. But why did he have a hard heart? Because he didn't know God. He wouldn't worship God. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't give God his due. He didn't say, hey, tell me about this God. See, what has he done? I, I don't know this God. Tell me more about him. No, he just says, I'm not going to do it. Right? He, I, I'm unwilling to do this. Go with me to Romans 1. Romans 1, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but just, just so that you can see this quickly. Um, if you want to, John has a series of messages on this, so you can go and hear this. But in Romans 1, 18 to 32, Paul says that the problem with humanity is what? We're sinners. What is the problem with humanity? Yes. What else? Very good. They don't go. Yes. What else? It's basically ignorance of God, right? It's ignorance of God. Look at this. I want you to look at this in, in, in those passages there. I mean, if we had time, we actually would go like verse by verse, but we don't. You see, truth is being suppressed and is being exchanged with a lie, right? Thinking has become futile and darkened. The mind is debased. Passions are dishonorable. Relationships are contrary to nature. And behavior is shameless, Paul says, right? Why? Why all of these issues? Well, because... There's a false notion of who God is, right? This is the root of human de depravity. This is the root of all sin that we've been talking about for the last 22 weeks. See, they, they really didn't understand God, the need for divine knowledge, writes Charles Hodge. It's both the effect and the cause of moral depravity. And, and really, that's the issue right there, right? Do you remember when we looked at Adam and Eve and sin? They had a wrong idea who God was for a split second. Uh, even if you look at Hosea chapter 4, the problem with Israel was idolatry, right? But the bigger issue there, Hosea says, which we will study in two years, I think, is that they didn't know God. They didn't know God. So you have... Just look at Israel's history, right? I want you to think of Israel's history, right? So Israel's history started with whom? With Abraham, remember? And then with his son. Uh, what was his son's name? Isaac. And then with Isaac's sons, what were their names? Jacob and Esau. And then with you know the, their 12 sons, right? And then you get to a point where Israel is in captivity. They're, they're freed by God. And instead of worshiping God, what are they doing? They're complaining. They're complaining about God. And then when God gives them the Ten Commandments and he gives them the law, what does Israel do? They disobey. But not once, not twice. It's constant. And finally, it gets to the time of the judges, right? And what happens? Everyone does whatever they want, right? And you think, okay, no, but they need a good king. And they finally get David, but 
they're not doing anything. And then they get solemn, and then the kingdom splits in two. And then God basically is so tired of the northern kingdom, he sends them to captivity. Then he gets tired of the southern kingdom, he sends them to captivity. And when they come back from captivity, right, 70 years later, and you think, oh, finally they learned the lesson, what happened? They're still not knowing who God is. And then when Jesus comes, they don't know who he is. They don't know who he is. That's a huge problem. And, and, and that's like, that's that vicious cycle, right? Of not knowing who God is, not understanding who God is, and really it's unbelief. They don't know who God is. But you might think, well, but how about the believers in the Bible? And you're thinking, yeah, there are some great examples of great believers. And that's what we call B in your outlines. Not knowing the right things about God, a believer's perspective. There are many believers who still don't know God. Think of Job, right? Righteous Job, right? A good man. What happens in chapter 38 to 41? What's that? He gets checked. Yes. Yes. What do you remember? Okay, so tell me someone that brave enough that can tell me the story of Job. Satan accuses God that goes away and Yeah. And what happens? God. Now that you started, you gotta keep going. God allows Satan to destroy his life. Yeah. How? What what does he destroy about him? Everything. Yeah. Yes. So the questionable advice, and that's where I wanted to get to, what is questionable about it? Yeah, so so it's about God and about him, right? So he's being charged with, I'm sure you've done something. Yeah, you got this coming to you, right? And what were they saying about God, his friends? Pretty much all of them. What, what were they saying about God? The God is what? Punishment. Yes. There's a retribution, right? That They're using basically worldly, what people thought in that time of God, that retribution theology, is you're getting what's coming to you. I, you can say you were good, or you, but... You, you've done something. And later when God speaks, right, in uh, Job 38 to 41, someone can give me a quick overview of 38 to 41. Who can do that? Yes. Well, that's a quick one. Yeah. Yes, I'm bigger than you. Yes. Or you can say, where were you? Right? I've done all these things. Where were you? And finally, what does God say to to Job and his friends. <laughs> you remember he says, so Job says, hey, I, I didn't know you. <laughs> As I, like I just, I'd heard of you, basically. I, I didn't know you. But then what is Job, what does God say to Job's friends, especially? To yeah, but why? He says, you didn't do what? Yeah, yes, but he says, you didn't speak what's right about me, right? Their view of God was bankrupt. I mean, it was like half truth, right? And, and I think that that's, that was an issue even with Job. Job was thinking, yeah, God is great. I worship God, but there's something going on here. He wasn't. He wasn't. He he didn't know the whole story about God, and and obviously he. I don't think he ever finds out what happened in that in heaven, but there is the, that fact that he didn't know. Do you know any other examples in the Bible of a believer that had the wrong view of God, uh, in one way or another, and it causes them to do something that they shouldn't do? Abraham, yes, yes, I have all those examples right here. What about Abraham? God promised him the offspring. Yeah. And Abraham didn't believe it was going to happen in the way that God said. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Now, do we would say that Abraham is not a believer? No, Abraham is the father of our faith. And yet, what didn't he believe about God, Brian? That he would have the child through Sarah. Yeah, and what what would that what is that called? Offspring. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my question. I had a bad question, sorry. It was my not you. You're good. I, You know, when you're thinking of something and you're trying to lead the witness, I'm really bad at that. That's why. Sorry, I was was trying to lead the witness. I was talking about he didn't believe in God's faithfulness. He didn't believe in God's sovereignty. He didn't believe, you know, that God can do whatever he wants to, even though God told him, hey, I can do anything. He didn't believe that. I mean, there are times he did believe it, right? But sometimes he just tried to do that push for things when he left for Egypt, right? He's pushing for these things. When he lied about his wife twice, he's pushing. He's thinking, well, maybe what if they kill her? What if they take, what if they kill me? He's not even thinking of her. He's thinking of himself. How about Gideon? You said Gideon, right? How about him? Gideon was the smallest tribe and the smallest yeah. person and had an angel come to him, so he had to test his faith by asking him to make it wet one day. Yeah, the, the fleece. Yes. So what didn't he trust about God? He didn't believe the angel. Yeah. So his truthfulness, right? He, well, do this magic tricks for me and I'll, and I'll believe in you, right? Oh, and you did. Okay, I'll do it again the other way around and I'll believe in you, right? I was thinking about Moses, Right? How about Moses? <laughs> right? Did he believe in God always? No. Think of, can you think of one instance where he didn't trust in God? Like the burning bush. The burning bush, yes. What else? The the yes. The yeah. Yeah. How about when he would get angry? And he said, I'm done. <laughs> Either kill me or kill them, Lord. Like, I, I, I'm done. Remember? <laughs> How about David, the man of, uh, after God's own heart? Was he always this great man of God? No. No. Right? I, I, I think of many times, but look, when you think about just even when he's fleeing Saul, and he goes into this, uh, remember when he, f- he fakes that he is crazy, and he goes to Gath, and he starts writing graffiti, graffiti on the wall. Remember that story? And he's like, you know, he's like, you know, foaming out the mouth, and he's not trusting the Lord. He's so fearful. Oh, God told him, hey, you're going to be the next king. And he, he's thinking, they're going to kill me here. Plus, Goliath is from Gath. They're going to know who I am. He's fearful. I don't want to make it personal, but how about us? <laughs> I'll make it personal for a couple of seconds. R.C. Sproul used to say that every time we sin, we it, it's like we've become atheists for that split second. And we don't trust the Lord, we don't trust his providence. Every time you worry, every time you you don't think rightly about about him, every time you doubt God's goodness, right? So that's not, not knowing the right things about God. But then finally, you see here, knowing God, a believer's perspective. <clears throat> knowing God. As we said before, knowing God is the most important thing about a person. Um, it either it actually leads to eternal life. Uh, look at John seventeen. Look what Jesus says. John seventeen three says, "This he is eternal life." This is Jesus praying, right? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. Whom you have sent. That is eternal life. 
knowing God. Knowing God. Um, I'm not a big fan of Matthew Henry, uh, all of his stuff, but when he's on, or he was on, he is on. Look at this quote right here that you have in front of you. Uh, Derek, you want to read that for us? To know him as our creator and to love him, obey him, submit to him, and trust in him as our owner, ruler, and benefactor, to devote ourselves to him as our sovereign Lord, depend upon him as our chief good, and direct all to his praise as our highest end. This this is life and death. Yeah. This is it. This is it. That's that is eternal life to know God right? To know him. Now, I was actually thinking of biblical examples of people that trusted uh, God. And I actually was thinking of the same people that trusted God. How about Abraham? Did he trust God? Of course he did. He moved in a time where no one moved, really. He moved alone with his wife and his nephew to a totally different area without his support system, without his family, which back then, that was the most important part of you. Uh, without your identity, he, he moved to another place because he was believing what God told him to do. How about Moses? Did he believe God? Absolutely he did, right? He went and faced the Pharaoh most likely he knew Pharaoh. He knew everyone there. I mean, that's where he grew up. And he had to show up there like a peasant, you know, with a staff <laughs> to talk to them. How about David? Did he trust God? Of course. Just read Psalms. Even after what happened that day when he became crazy and foamed of the mouth and was writing that graffiti on the wall and the king, a Philistine king, kicked him out of his side. He actually wrote a psalm and he talks about how God had freed him from all his fears. Of course, of course. So what you think of God is what's most important about you. And you can go down the list, right? Just even read Hebrews 11 of these people that had faith. And sometimes you're like, faith in what? Well, faith in God's promises. They believe God. And I think that that's so important to see that because when you look at someone that knows God in the scriptures, they're going to make mistakes. David is the perfect example, right? And then at the same time, they know who God is and they will always repent. Well, think about you and me, right? Knowing God is the most important thing about us. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah, that's the first question we ask someone, right? What do you do, right, for a living? Or what do you go to school if you're younger? But really, the most important thing about you is, do you know God? Right? That's the question we should be asking each other, right? You meet someone for the first time, hey, do you know God, right? Why not? That should be the question. So that is the reason why we want to study God. Because we want to know Him so that we can trust Him, so that we can live lives that are consequent to who God is. And you know that every time you sin, you are proclaiming to everyone, especially to God, God doesn't exist. Or you cover your eyes, like Adam did, all those years ago, and you're saying, God can't see me. But he can, because he's omniscient. And he can see everything about you, and he knows what you're thinking, even right now, sitting there. I don't know what you're thinking. You're smiling. You're probably thinking, that's awesome. Or you're thinking, great, I'm not coming again. Right? <laughs> I don't know. you, But God does, which is great. So, We're going to look at the attributes of God. So look at number two there. We're going to look at the attributes of God. Now, attribute. What is an attribute? An attribute is a feature that uniquely defines a person, right? Uh, Even with person or 
right? It's, it's, it's something that defines someone. So when we talk about the attributes of God, we're, we're going to talk about the character of God. We're going to talk about his nature, his perfections, his essence, uh, his being, his quality. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to actually see what is God like, right? Uh, so, so to know who God is, we need to know what God is like. Moses says in Exodus 15, 11, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Now, without looking at your Bibles, without looking at your Bible, you cannot look at your Bibles. Look at me. What was Exodus 15 about? And what happened right before Exodus 15? I said you get a prize, but I have nothing to give you. <laughs> What happened? No, can we have, it's 20, chapter 20. So this is before the Ten Commandments. Something big happened. No, well, I mean, it was the Passover happened before that. So this, something big happened. No, that's 32. That, something big, like some crossing. Yes, very good. Excellent. Very, very good. Very good. I can tell you guys know your Bibles. Right? And what had happened? So, what happened at the Red Sea? Moses is, was led by God with the cloud. Yes. And Pharaoh's army came right after him. Yeah. When they went through the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army went right in their chariots into the Red Sea. Exactly. But God marked for them to get out. Yeah. They didn't get out. <laughs> They're still down there, right? We could say. So, did you see that? Like, so, Moses sings a song in chapter 15, or writes a song. I don't know if he had a good voice or not, but he certainly writes a song. And he says that. He says, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Now, does he mean, hey, there are older gods and you're the best? What do you think he means by that? Exactly, yes. It's, it's a rhetorical question. It's saying like, look, there's no one like you. There's no one like you. No one. And he continues saying, saying he says, who is like you, majestic in, hol in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. I mean, what he just did for them. I mean, they crossed the Red Sea, dry land, <laughs> incredible. And I mean, it was, it was amazing that then... Pharaoh's army, they, they were gaining on them, and now they're all dead, and they're free. God did that. <clears throat> Even at the end of his life, he says in Deuteronomy 3, he says, uh, Moses says, what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Think about that. No one. The answer is no one. No one. He's not saying, well, there's a couple of gods that are pretty good. They'll give you a run for your money. No, there's nothing. They don't exist. I mean, God is undefeated. David says in 2 Samuel 7, 22, you cannot go there. I'm going to read it to you because I'm going to ask you something about it. He says, for this reason, you are great, David says, O Lord God. For there's no one like you, and there's no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Now, this is a little easier. I think it's easier. What happened in 2 Samuel 7? Yes, the Davidic covenant. And what, what was it about, the Davidic covenant? Yeah, so David gets a, a huge promise here. And he's telling us, one of your descendants is going to reign forever. And then how does David respond to this? There's none like you. There's no God besides you. He's not saying, well, there's a couple of gods out there. No, he said, like, nothing. There's nothing like you. There's nothing like you. This is, this is the same way that Solomon 
phrase in First Kings uh, eight twenty three. I won't ask you what happened there, but it was the it was basically the dedication of the temple. And Solomon says, "There is no god like you in heaven above or on earth below." He's saying, "There's nothing. You are unique. You are the unique god of heaven and earth." Even the psalmist says in Psalm 89.8, O Yahweh, God of hosts, who is like you, almighty God? There's no one like God. There is, God is undefeated. Not that anyone has ever tried to go against it, right? But he's undefeated in every single way. There's no one like him. So when we, we're looking at the attributes of God, we want to know that God who's undefeated. We want to know because there's no one like him. And yes, we're going to get some headaches thinking about God because we won't be able to understand him because there's no one like him. Now, how are we going to classify God's attributes, right? You perhaps have I've heard this as you read a, a book on the attributes of God. And at the end, I have a couple of books that I recommend. They're not required reading, but if you want to read more about it, uh, you can read. Um, so how are we going to classify the attributes of God? Well, there's there's two ways. Well, there's many ways to classify God's attributes. We're going to do it in, in two ways. We're going to we're going to go through the in, uh, what we call incommunic, incommunicable attributes and communicable attributes. The first ones are attributes that God doesn't share. He doesn't communicate to others. No one can imitate God in this. Um, for example, I can't tell you, hey, James, you need to be more omniscient, right? Um, okay, right? You can't. Even though sometimes you want to be omniscient, you, you can't. Or, or you need to be more eternal. Uh, or or you, need to be, you need to be more independent. I mean, truly what independence means in terms of God. Um, God doesn't share that with anyone. And the other one is the communicable attributes. And those are the ones that God shares or communicates. Uh, not perfectly, because we can't, but for example, love. Uh, God is love. That's one of his attributes. Most likely we're going to talk about love at the end of this series. Um, so when we say, can you love? Yes, you can love. Imperfectly, but you can love. You, you know love because God has loved you. Or wisdom. Right? God is wisdom. He, that's one of his attributes. Or truth. God is truth. Do you know what truth is? Yes. But perfectly? No. So, so then, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at those two types of attributes. Look at the quote that I have here um, by John Feinberg. Um, Nate, you want to read that for me? Thank you. So that's how we're going to we're going to classify them. And as and as we talk about them, as we start talking about this, we're going to talk about how there's some attributes that they're going to be great because we're going to be able to to see them and we can actually emulate somehow like love and wisdom and truth and others. But there are some of them that we are not going to be able to to do so. Uh, and it's okay because God is God and, and we are not, right? Um, so where are we going? Let me just, I, these are not all the attributes we're going to go through. Some of them we're going we're gonna to go through probably a couple more. Uh, and then we're going to kind of fuse some of them together. But just to, for you to get a taste, we're going to start with the incomprehens incomprehensibility of God. We're not going to be able to, we don't understand who God is. God is incomprehensible. And yet at the same time, he has revealed ourselves to us. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about aseity, the aseity of God, that God is independent. You and I depend on things. 
or of things. If you don't eat, guess what happens? If you don't drink water, uh, we all have parents, right? God doesn't have parents. So he doesn't need anything from anyone. Uh, we're going to look at simplicity. And that's going to be a, one of the tough ones, but not that God is simple, but simplicity means like you and I are complex individuals, right? You know, for, in order for you to be here, you need to, you need to have a body and a soul. If you don't have a soul, guess what? You're not alive. <laughs> if you don't have a body, guess what? You're a ghost, right? Uh, we, that's bad. You don't want to be a ghost. That's a joke. <laughs> Laugh later. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> but God doesn't, right? He doesn't have parts, right? He, he's not more love than he is immutable. He just is. We'll talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about uh, impassibility. The God is not driven by passions like you and I. He, he doesn't make decisions in passion or because he was upset. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about transcendence. That God is beyond belief, above everything. And yet at the same time, we're going to talk about imminence, that he is close to us. We're going to talk about those two together. Uh, we're going to talk about eternity. And our brains are going to break trying to think about, wait a second, eternity, like he never not existed? Yes. We're going to talk about uh, immutability, the fact that he never changes, ever. We're going to talk about his sovereignty. We're going to talk about his love, truly love, not like the love from the love songs, true love. We're going to talk about, talk about faithfulness. We even are going to talk about spirituality. We're, we're, it's not here. But God is spirit. And what does it mean when Paul worships God and calls it the invisible God? Why worship God because he's invisible? Why? why? Well, we're going to look at that. And hopefully all of this, as you leave our class, you would, you would have a greater view of who God is and your thoughts would hopefully you know, gravitate to worship God as we think about this. Now, why is all of this important? Why? Why? Because you know this. So everything I'm going to say now, you know, hopefully. But I'm going to remind you of everything you're going to hear now. Because the knowledge of God truly affects who we are, right? Knowing God affects how we live. It affects how we invest our entire lives. It shapes how we, even we parent our marriage, how we get involved in ministry, how we go to church, where we go to church, how we think about life. In fact, every part of our lives is affected with, by what we think of God. Now, I'm going to ask you a, a personal question. Answer only in your head. You, have, you, you don't have to answer out loud. Uh, or don't answer out loud. <laughs> but have you ever struggled with anxiety? Have you ever been anxious about something in life? Have you struggled? Have you ever felt anxious about the future, the present, even the past? What do you think is at the core of anxiety? And what is the remedy for anxiety? See, what's at the core of anxiety is a small God. Not a God that is sovereign. Not a God that takes care of everything. You know, it's like that book that says when, when people are big and, and God is small, when it deals with, you know, with fear of man. Really, I think that most of our sins, if not all of them, deal with a small God who, in the case of anxiety, we, we forget that God watches over us. If, if he watches over the birds, how much he's going to watch over his kids, right? Look at that quote there by, by Calvin. Melissa, can you read that? Down after such 
See, Calvin really understood that if you're truly going to understand yourself, if you're truly going to understand your sin, then you need to understand who God is, right? You hear this about this all the time with people. You know, you hear their testimony, and they're like, they're, they're living in sin, they're living for themselves like all, all of us were, right? And what turns them around is it's not that someone proved to them that God existed. Maybe some do, but a lot of them is they saw God for who God is. All of us, really, if you think about it, you saw God for who he was. It wasn't some clever move from someone else. It was seeing God for who he was. God is holy, right? So that turned your heart. Well, God is love or his care for you. So this is why we want to study this. And ultimately, it's that last quote there by uh, Maurice uh, Roberts. Um, he's Scottish, but um, we'll have our resident British person, <laughs> right? I read this. Uh, Chris, can you read this? Thank you. It truly is, right? The thought of God enlivens your action. You don't have to be uh, a martyr or in prison because you're a Christian or uh, a missionary or you don't have to be a faithful pastor. You can be at home doing medial tasks, seemingly medial tasks. Uh, but to know God and to remind yourself that it is your master who's called you to do this, it really does enliven every action, isn't it? Now, if you want to, this is just if you want to, I have some recommended reading for this. Now, we're not going to find this to a T, and I, uh, these books, but they're great if you want to uh, read more. A.W. Pink's uh, book, The Attributes of God, is a classic, fantastic. You can read that. Uh, very clear, short, to the point. You can read that as you do your quiet time. I mean, just a great, a great, uh, great book. Another great book, this book is probably about five, six years old, is Non Greater by Matthew Barrett. I read this book uh, during, uh, during COVID for nine weeks. We were, we actually in Spain, we were confined to our homes. We couldn't leave at all except to go buy bread or, or food uh, once a day. So we had a, there's so much Netflix you can watch. So we read a ton and this book like really challenged me. Non-grader, deals with the attributes of God. Great book, very easy. Even though he's a theologian, he makes it very easy for, for you to learn. Great examples, even funny in some parts, but just that great. Uh, you can get either one of those two books. You don't need them, but uh, be great just to even think about it. Hey, we're going to study this, and you can read about it. And if you have any questions, we can even talk about it. So uh, thank you, guys. Well, next week we'll start, and I hope it, it's helpful and that we will leave with our hearts full. Yes, Jack. Matthew Barrett. It's, it's right here in, in the uh, notes. I don't get any money from any royalties from any of this. I'm just, I'm just being uh, telling you. Of these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. And we want to worship you for being the God that uh, revealed himself to us and that we can know you. And Father, ultimately, that is our desire. 
that the thought of you would enliven every action. Um, even as we go into service and, and sing of your grace, even as we hear your word, even as we partake of the Lord's Supper, that everything we do today, that it will be um, just um, amazingly uh, shaped by the thought of you and to know you. And that's what we want to do uh, this morning and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.